She's supposed to wave at me. <laughs> that is a very energetic chair. It is an energetic chair. I know. Is that good? Yeah, it's kind of wiggly. That's fine. Kind of last time. Is that going to be a problem? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, is she going to bring me, Kellen? Is she going to give me the mic to start? Because I can just use this. But I don't care. I just can't stand behind the podium. I've never done it, and I can't do it. I don't mind it. Do I don't mind it. It's okay. I do yeah. mind it. Because right before you read, he's going to read. Right okay. before. Yeah. We're good? Sure, of course. Hi, everybody. And thank you so much for, um, for coming out for poetry. Um, there are so many things to do um, in our city all the time. And I, I know especially tonight, there's a lot going on. So we really appreciate you being here. And um, I know that some of you are writers um, and others are just readers of poetry. And uh, we appreciate having all of you here. So thanks so much. I'm Helen Wallace and I curate um, the Poetry at the Dali program. And unfortunately, Dr. Hein cannot make it tonight. Um, he sends his regrets. Uh, but I want to do first a shout out to him because he's been so wonderfully supportive of our program. We're going on eight and a half years now um, with the program. And um, uh, those of you who know Dr. Hine know that he's a poet too. Um, and he's just been terrific to work with and uh, on this program. He's pivotal. Also want to do a shout out to Dr. Kim McCrary. Kim, where are you? Are you in the back? There she is. Thank you, Kim. And also Joy Garrett Douglas, who's just coming in. Both of you guys are such huge help with the poetry program. And John Fisher, who's our tech czar in the back. Thank you, John. Um, uh, we couldn't do the program without all of you. Um, and lastly, thanks to the city of St. Pete for supporting our program. Um, we appreciate that very much. Um, as protocol demands, I will read one short poem of my own, and then I'm going to turn the program over to these two fabulous poets. I'm so excited um, to have Lola Haskins with us um, and Carolina Hachandani. Uh, their work is amazing, and you, you really, if you don't come all the time, you picked a really good night to be here. Um, uh, you're going to love their work, love their poems. OK, I'm going to read one short poem, um, and then I'm going to introduce Carolina, and then uh, Lola will read after. And then, of course, we'll have our Q&A, as usual. This is a poem um, I wrote for my mother, uh, and it's called Bookmarking with Dementia. She insists on keeping her wallet in the oven and fixates on minutia, a gate that isn't closed, a dent in the fender of a car. Windshield visors tilting different angles drive her mad, but she loves her pots of roses pruned to identical heights about her house and her half book of Faulkner in her hands. An empty trash can sitting by her, by her chair, she stares at a page for several minutes, her fingertip tracing the whisper of words already fading, as if to stitch meaning through the lines. Drifting to the bottom of each sheet, she softly tears it out, balls it up, and drops it nonchalantly on the floor, then starts again. Who am I to question her way of keeping track of where she is? There's courage in refusing each day as the same blank page. Thank you. Thank you. Carolina. Carolina Hachandani is a Latinx South Asian poet born in Brazil and raised in various parts of the United States. Her debut poetry collection, The Book Eaters, which, by the way, you can get out front, um, thanks to Tombolo Books for always selling our poets' books. Um, hope you'll catch them on the way out, and they'll be happy to sign them. Um, the Book Eaters won the 2023 Perugia Press Prize and was released just in this past September. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. um, Hachandani holds degrees from Brown, Texas State, and Northwestern University. Her honors include scholarships from the Breadloaf Writers Conference, the Rona Jaffe Foundation, a Community of Writers, Ten House Writers Workshop, and Napa Valley Writers Conference. Her poetry has appeared in Agni, Alaska Quarterly Review, the Belloet 
uh, Poetry Journal, Blackbird, Cincinnati Review, Missouri Review, Prairie Schooner, and other journals. These are all fabulous journals um, uh, to be published in. She's a Goodrich Assistant Professor of English in Omaha, Nebraska, where she lives with her husband and daughter. Please welcome Carolina. Hello. Thank you so much for coming. Um, thank you, Helen, for that lovely introduction and um, to the Dali Museum for hosting this event. Um, I uh, am really happy to be here. I live in Omaha, Nebraska, as Helen mentioned, and uh, I, I, whenever there's an opportunity to get out of the landlocked state and, and approach water, it feels like a kind of liberation. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, as uh, Helen said, uh, I'll be reading from uh, my book, The Book Eaters. I started this book in 2016. Um, at, at, uh, my, my daughter at that time was uh, a young little toddler and was just beginning to speak um, and to, to walk. And meanwhile, um, my father was beginning to lose language. Um, and I was basically witnessing these, um, these, these kinds of development that were going um, in different directions. Um, and sandwiched between those two generations, um, I, I couldn't help but write. So um, with that, I'll, I'll go ahead and begin. Um, the first poem is called The Boxes. We move, we move every few years. What's made of glass, we wrap in newspaper, boxing memories that, for others, live in hometowns. Their memories are perennials, sprouting thoughts of years before, when holes were dug, when kids couldn't decide between irises and alliums. Then the irises won, peddling memories of arguments, reconciliations purpling that summer. We move in trucks, in boxes, our contents, four continents, and who knows how many cities, rooms, drawers. How many corners of us are emptied in the new town, free of the objects left at the last town's goodwill? We miss the goodwill of old friends. Memories stretch from the last place, the way I reached for an apple at the old grocery store, the whole pyramid of them toppling over, bruised, rolling. Memories of things falling do not exist in neat arrangements on display tables. They do not gleam on the waxed skins of red delicious apples assembled in the same spot in the same store we'd visit for years. We don't have the years. We store the store, our memories rolling to the next town, where some sense of not belonging lives under my hot cheeks as I overhear a girl tell another girl, the eyebrows of the new girl are like the tail of a squirrel. <laughs> I hear the giggles. I feel the apples bruised rolling through my body, which is no grocery store. The floor of me does not shine. I am not lit with bright lights. I am the boxes we take to the next place, which tear and are taped. When my father starts to forget, I understand. The places never held us. We hold the places. We move. <clears throat> I had to write one poem about um, how my parents met. Um, they, uh, they met in, in Rio. Um, they were, my mom is Brazilian, my father is Indian, and um, neither of them was meant to be in Rio that day. So this is an interesting story. Author unknown. There's a story that rolls daily over the streets of my father's mind its asphalt enameled with rain. A bus treads through a puddle that fights gravity as the bus halts and hisses, wets my father's shirt. 
Doors part. He steps in, unaware the bus carries the woman he'll marry, my mother. A light turns green, the story accelerates, jostling the strangers inside till the bus jolts to a stop, a passenger's flung onto my father's lap. My mother smiles, a conversation starts. Neither of them is meant to be in Rio that day. Today, my father quotes Newton as he narrates this tale. Inertia made that passenger fall, as motion always wants to stay in motion. But who grayed the skies? Who made the rain percuss Rio's rooftops like an amateur drummer so no one could go on foot that day? I want to know who authored the story driven by the bus that set us in motion, my family on its course. Now, the next poem's uh, addressed to my father, as are, are many of the poems in the first section of my book. Um, he was uh, born in pre-partition India, and um, in 1947, when uh, India's inde independence was declared, his family made a southward journey from what's now Pakistan to what's now India. Um, and when I was growing up, um, I, I got to be uh, the audience of, of many, many lectures on history and religion. <laughs> Partition. In your version of the story, people butter their fingers with notions of God, splitting India into a smaller India, a new Pakistan. The way a single roti's dough is pulled apart, the new spheres rolled in the palms, then flattened, the idea of God, the destroyer of human bonds, you will say. The reason for new borders, new pain, to sprout on either side of a dividing line. You'll go on. I'll picture the edges of your words blurring to a hum as I think of how to wrest your rant from you. A rolling pin barrels over dough, widens the soft disk, makes it fine, you are fragile, like a story that stretches belief, like a nation, like a thin disk of dough that sticks to a surface, tearing when it's peeled back. I don't know how to part the story from the person and keep the person. Um, so I had to write a poem about Nebraska, <laughs> so you know a little bit about it. <laughs> um, uh, in the beginning of the poem, when you hear the words here, here, it'll be H-E-R-E, H-E-R-E, and then um, eventually that will shift to H-E-A-R, H-E-A-R. And I think you'll be able to tell when it shifts. This is called Self-Portrait as the Cornfields. As the past recedes from memory, I retrace my steps. I am a citizen of a former British colony that rebelled from England with a great tea party, declaring itself its motherland, America. Was it orphaned? Did it kill its own mother? Poor England. Where are you from? The other Americans ask me. My mother is Brazilian. My father is Indian. I was born in Brazil, but I've been here a long while. Here where? Here, here. Here in New York, Texas, North Carolina, Tennessee, Rhode Island, a year abroad in England, then California, Iowa, Texas again, then a year in South Korea, then Chicago, then another South, but this time South Dakota, which isn't in this country South at all. <laughs> now, Nebraska. Here, here, where the corn is fed to cattle who don't graze. Here, here, as they shout in the House of Commons to affirm the speaker's thoughts. Here, here, to the English that seems foreign. Here, here, to the rustle of corn that doesn't belong here. 
Hear here to the language I use to build this block of words, which you may not hear at all if you are quiet, if you follow the lines with your eyes, unspeaking like mine as they trace the rows of corn in the fields, fed to the cows that Indians know as holy, fed to the cows the Americans know as beef. I will become your cornfields, striped, farmed, not native at all, but everywhere, everywhere. The next one I think might be one of my favorites. Um, I feel like I shouldn't have a favorite. It's like, they're all my children and I should love them all equally. <laughs> but I suppose I'm a bad mother when it comes to my poems. <laughs> yeah, so this is, a, this is a, um, one of my favorites. And it is, a, I, I, I started writing this because um, my uh, in-laws, they are avid bird watchers. And as I watch them watch birds, I think about what is my relationship? Like, why don't I take the same pleasure in you know, identifying the birds as they do? And so um, that's what this poem came from. It's called Nesting. When the birds' names doubled with words that summoned ideas from their hiding places, the flicker, the chat, the swift, the lark, I watched them more closely, confident that somewhere a thought would escape the bird, alighting upon a pun, and I'd find meaning in a world that glided above me, hardly dipping into my mind. When I saw a swallow's nest balanced on a truss, like an idea teetering upon a word, I waited for the mother swallow to return with her twigs, her morsel of mud, her blade of grass. What idea would nestle there? Later, as the babies pecked themselves out of shells, I saw their open-beaked pleas, wondered at their desperate mouths and how they swallowed. I believed in no gods, and when words with different meanings echoed themselves, I felt I lived inside a poem someone else had made, and I rhymed with every bird on my line. <laughs> Memory halved. I remember creating an edible model of a cell when I was 12. My parents helped. We gathered jelly beans, dry noodles, poppy seeds. In a clear round casserole dish, peach jello congealed, turned to cytoplasm. Circus peanuts from last year's Halloween metamorphosed into mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, my textbook said, as they extract energy from food, deriving from one substance, another. We are always making doubles of what exists, replicas of real things, memories that try to copy experience, even as they tweak the color of a dress the weather, the day of a funeral, and whether we were even there at all. I remember fashioning the nucleus from a hard-boiled egg I cut in two. I know, even as my father forgets whole years of my life, that I am more than partly loved. But I recall my shock when he reached for the half of the nucleus I didn't use and took a bite. <laughs> a cord to bind us. Was it, not, was it not then, as I saw the future embodied in the body of my child, I sought a story to tether us together, my daughter, myself, a story, too, to tie the mother me to the one I was before I birthed her. The cord had been severed. Then I heard a woman ask, is that white baby yours? As if all I was was not white, as if all my daughter was was white. 
as if I were a brown wet nurse feeding the baby the only white drops of me. The next one is, is my daughter's favorite one of my poems. Um, when she's in the audience, you can see her sit up tall and kind of, you know, um, yeah, adjust her little feathers. <laughs> like, I'm the only one here who's had a poem written about me. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so this is called Small Green Bowl. At 18 months, my daughter says, do you want more? When she wants more grapes, more blueberries, more cubes of cheese to fill her small green plastic bowl. Do you want to get up? Do you want to go out? Do you want to listen to that song again? <laughs> These are the questions I ask her, which she repeats. No I comes to fill the small green plastic bowl. Mama speaks of herself as mama, and mama's child is always you. As you learn to search yourself for the small green plastic bowl, I find an eye, as do you. We fill the bowl together with cold berries. So the next one is, is the most re recently written one of my poems. Um, it, uh, after I declared my manuscript complete, um, a, a manuscript that my father is a major character in, he actually passed away the, the day after. And um, I had, uh, I, I found out about the, the Perugia Press Prize, and um, but I like looked at this manuscript that I had submitted and that won this prize and suddenly it felt like it needed to be edited. And so um, I managed to edit death into the manuscript. Um, but this is, uh, the, I, I, I managed to squeeze this in in July, just before this went into the printers. It's called Order of Operations. And this will be the last poem that I'll be reading this evening. You try to follow your father's dictum, stay ahead, cover next week's chapter in algebra now, so when the teacher delivers the lesson in the future, the future will be a memory for you, the word problem you've already solved. A family travels in a train at a velocity X miles per hour greater than a car. From inside the train, the car seems to slip slowly backward like salmon swimming against the current to spawn. But you are not chasing time to make life. As you speed through the weeks to the destination, you try to quantify the benefit of an earlier arrival. You need to know why, in the textbook of your life, the order of operations insists that you cry for your father before he dies, so when he dies, you are prepared. You'll live in the memory of pain, which is not pain. It's a family moving forward on a train. Well, Carolina, thank you so much for that beautiful, beautiful reading, those very moving poems. So another hand for Carolina. And before I introduce Lola Haskins, a couple more um, announcements. For, we have some writers in the audience. Uh, we actually have Peter Meinke and Bob Devin Jones, who were our last readers last time. So, <laughs> and I know I saw Chip Webster, and I, th I think there's some other writers. Sally Willis is in the audience, and um, and other writers. I'm sorry if I can't see you, but thank you for being here. I do want to mention that we have a sign-up sheet tonight. This is the first time we've done this. A sign-up sheet for anyone who might like to. Um, be part of an open mic night here at the Dali. Um, so please sign up if you'd like. Um, just put your name on the list. And uh, we don't yet have a date. But uh, if you have a couple poems and would like to be part of that, it would just be two poems probably per person. But we'd love to have you do that if you're interested. So um, you'll find that sign-up sheet uh, out front. So 
Okay, I also want to mention to those of you who are tuning in, um, we are being live streamed. And um, even if you can't be in the theater, we're very happy that you're with us tonight. So thanks for joining us. For Lola Haskins, so Lola has read with us before. Um, she, uh, along with Peter Meinke, are, are just total rock stars in the world of poetry in Florida. And we are so delighted, Lola, to have you back again um, with another new book, you know, two poets, both with new books. And uh, we're really, really thrilled um, to have you here. Lola, Lola's poetry has appeared in The Atlantic, the Christian Science Monitor, Georgia Review, Southern Review, London Review of Books, the Beloit um, Poetry Journal, Prairie Schooner, and it's even been broadcasted on BBC and NPR. Homelight, her new book, is her 14th collection. Wow. <laughs> Before that, Asylum, University of Pittsburgh Press in 2019, uh, was featured in the New York Times Magazine. Past honors include the Iowa Poetry Prize, two NEAs, two Florida Book Awards, Narrative po Poetry Prizes from Southern Poetry Review and the New England Poetry Review, a Florida Edens Prize for Environmental, environmental Writing, and the Emily Dickinson Prize um, from the Poetry Society of America. Um, those are all huge honors, and it is a big, big honor to have you here tonight. Thank you, Lola. Well, in the first place, I would have to say that all that proves is I'm old. <laughs> so don't get excited. I am going to read, take you on a tour, like a gallery tour through this book, because it has a particular uh, progress. So I started it with a section called On the Shoulders of Giants. Is everybody hearing well? OK. I started with, with that because I feel that we are not paying attention to what came before us. And that's, I personally have burst into tears many times by poems that were written before Christ was born. And we're forgetting that. And I don't want us to forget it. I'm trying not to. So I have some tribute poems in this first section. I'm not trying to be comprehensive at all. And I'm just going to do one of them. And this is um, after Sappho. More than the shells on the beach, I desire the shells in the mountains. The shells on the beach break easily. The shells on the mountains are ancient seas turned bone. I wake, craving them with my tongue. <laughs> Thanks. I'm just going to tell you about one other. I'd like to do more, but I don't like overstaying my welcome. So I've got, I even have a timer. <laughs> well, I don't usually do that, but I just feel bad speaking longer than I'm supposed to. So I just do want to tell you about one other because it's a double. The section is in two parts. And the second part is a woman named Marjorie Shelley who restored a Michelangelo drawing. And she and Michelangelo were being equally celebrated in what I wrote. So I can't read it, it's too long. So the second section is called Wings. And I'll just do a couple of those and a half. <laughs> uh, the first one is called The Dove. Today, I saw a soft gray dove, elegant as the most elegant French woman, perched on a fence rail as if all Paris were spread below her, who, as I went by, neither flew nor spoke. And what passed between us I understood. I was not worth her throat. And nothing. Not mist, not thicket tree, not windy leaves, not even the deepest darks of night can conceal her now. 
I would know that silence anywhere. I know it's strange, but this one's called The Woodpecker. It's, it's a lot more straightforward. He swoops, dips as if he's forgotten something, swoops again. Eventually, he lands high above my head. So high, I almost fall over backwards watching him hammer at the tree like a resolute toddler pounding pegs. Oh, woodpecker, 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 I love your hat. <laughs> um, the last poem in this section is called Ask an Ornithologist, because I have found that sometimes ornithologists are pretty stuck up. <laughs> so here are just a few little things from it. Question. Is there any name for a flock of goldfinches? Answer, yes, there is. A flock of goldfinches is called a mint, unless you see it after sunset, in which case it is an after-dinner mint. <laughs> this is uh, robins. Why do robins sing so loudly? Answer, they're all deaf. And this one is, is about chickens. What does a hen mean when she goes bark, 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 Answer, she is celebrating. She has just laid an egg. Question, will she celebrate again when the egg hatches? Answer, no. So there, there are other things in there, but those are, that's a sample. <laughs> Thank you. The next section of this book is called And They Are Gone. We go from wings to And They Are Gone. And it's about how arrogant our species is. But the poems in there are too long for me to do. I mean, I would like to, but I can't because it's, I don't have time. But you can read the book if you want. And I'm really serious about this. I wasn't kidding. The one after that is called Inhumanity with parentheses around the I-N. And I'll do two of those. The first one is called The Coup, and it's about Noriega. I offered them my chest and told them, go ahead. But even Gonzalez, who hated me the most, could not. How sweetly habit grows, like mold on shoes in our hot country. I told them their own troops, a prickle of boys, brown hands slippery on their guns, were loyal to me. And now I tell them sing, mouths full of dirt or no. And even the ones whose throats I slit sing. The second one, I'm just going to do two from this one. Um, and this is um, called Aleppo. And it's kind of current, actually. The father speaks of his six-month-old boy, born here, who has never seen the sky. The baby thinks. He, he, wait, see, he thinks, the baby thinks, that the rusty stains on the ceiling of the family's one room is all there is. There is a ceasefire. There is rubble. But today, the father showed his son what he could not have known to dream. Air blue as azure crossed by clouds. He cannot remember when he last felt such joy. The people of Aleppo are striking against the aid trucks. They do not want food or clothes, they say. Bring them peace. <laughs> wow. 
The next section is called Corona for the obvious reason. And the f I'm just going to do one, two, yeah, three poems in it. Um, the first one is called How to Fall Asleep During a Pandemic. <laughs> I keep a book on my bedside table from when my mind won't stop. It never fails. Half a page and I'm gone. My friend who wrote this book should be pleased. Not everyone can sit by his reader like a father singing to his fearful child and summon the moon for her and a pillow soft as the sea. This next one is a really important poem in my life, actually. I live alone, and one day a plumber was fixing my sink. His name was JB, and we were both masked. And he said, well, how are you getting on in this? And it had been, it was middle of the pandemic. And I said, you know, I have found something that really f makes me feel a lot better. And he said, well, what is it? And I said, you think I'm crazy. And he said, no, I won't. And so I told him. I said, I go and I hold a tree. For the last 20 years, I've worked, walked in the woods every day anyway. But this is the first time it occurred to me to really hold a tree. And so I wrote a, had written this poem. And I said, you want to hear how it is for me? And he said, yeah, OK. And so it's called 100,000 Lives. When I hold you, my hands do not meet behind. When I press my cheek against your bark, I'm asking you to mark me. When I lean into you, you rise toward the light. Grandfather, thank you for your calm. I have been so afraid. So, so JB said, could I have a copy of that? I said, really? He said, yeah, I want one. So I made him a copy. And about six weeks later, I was walking down the sidewalk, and this van with its windows all dark pulled up right next to me, and the light's way up there. And I'm going, what the hell? And this line st arm sticks out of the van. I'm thinking, oh my god, now what? <laughs> and the arm says, hey, it's JB. That is an awesome poem. <laughs> and then he says, he points to the passenger seat, and he says, my, and my girlfriend here loves it too. <laughs> is that worth coming for or what? I mean, that is about <laughs> as worth as, you, worth as you can get. And actually, I, was, I have a very close friend. I was tutoring her, tutoring her in English, but she's become one of my several extra daughters. And I'm very close to her. And she translated it into Italian and sent it all over Italy. And then it's been read in a bunch of churches. And what I would like to do, this is if anybody knows how it can be done, I want to put it on a billboard, because there are lonely people who don't know what the solution is. Um, and I don't want my name on it. I just want the poem on the billboard. And I will say that since I wrote that poem, I have taken to visiting grandfather whenever a friend of mine is in trouble. And this is going to sound, you may not believe me, but it's the truth. Uh, I have had three friends, one of whom is a doctor who's famous for being a diagnostician of just a really talented diagnostician. And he was positive he had leukemia. And then there were two other friends, each of whom was about to be diagnosed with cancer in the next few days. And I went, and I went to that tree, and I held him. And I said, please take care of them. And none of them had it. Zero. That's the truth. And I've, I've done it afterwards, too. And I have never had grandfather fail me once. I know that sounds like I made it up, but I didn't. I really didn't. I did not make that up. That's the truth. OK, so this one's called Walking at Night. Darkened houses, where the blinds are drawn, glowing rectangles, where they're not most often scenes of flickering blue light playing across walls, 
But once I saw a man lifting a stack of flowered plates off a shelf as gently as if he had been landing, kneeling in a garden. Okay, uh, the next section is called The Slapped Girl, and I've never written about myself ever like this. I don't write about myself very often at all, but for some reason, maybe because I'll be 80 in a week, uh, which was not my idea, let me tell you what. Um, maybe that's why. Maybe I'm willing to be that open. But so it's, this, it's, it's called The Slapped Girl, and the first poem in it says, when I was a child, I used to walk up the fire road behind my house. When I saw a gleam in the dirt ahead, I'd pry it up. At home, I'd clean it and cradle it in my hand. Sometimes it would tremble me, how safe it seemed. Nothing in my life was safe, that's the point. Um, okay, so, oh yeah, this is called 1967. The moment at the top of the drive when my first love turned and said again, come now, returns with the evening star, as does the rush of white air that partnered him when he jumped, then exploded every bit of him, khaki shirt and all, when he hit the bay. Who but a fool believes a poem may be got for nothing? Okay, I'm, I'm, this is not all that heavy. This is better. But, I mean, that's a true story, obviously. I wouldn't have made it up. This is called The Skunk. The Skunk was my birthday present 15 years before I left G. When we went to pick him up, he reached out from his owner's arms and bit, bit my finger hard enough to draw blood. I should have known then, but I didn't. Because once you decide something's what you want, that's all there is. When W, the new man, left me sitting in a restaurant because he just remembered he needed to do the laundry, I waited. I memorized the menu. I waited and while everyone was clearing out. I waited until they turned out the lights. The skunk was supposed to be descented. W was supposed to be on meds, too. We used to kiss ourselves dizzy. We never got where we were going. By the end, he might as well have been stray. He might as well have been living under the house. <laughs> OK, I have never written, this is truth, I've never written a love poem to a man until now. So this, this is a series of poems I've written to my, the person I love at the moment and forever. Um, and the, it has a tagline from Garcia Marquez. It says, I'll translate it into English. It says, every person lives three lives, the public life, the private life, and the secret life. This is called the secret life. And the first, I'm going to do four of them. They're not long. The first one is called Soñando, well, I, Soñando Contigo, which is a better way than the English, which is dreaming of you. We're walking hand in hand through a forest of uh, bluebells. The sun is falling through the leaves the way my hand first trembled when I realized I loved you. It's midnight. We're lying on a bed by the sea. Kiss after kiss, the waves are breaking. When you stopped at the corner and turned to look at me, and I saw myself in your brown eyes, I suddenly realized I could die of this. Uh, there is a hill. 
there, wait a minute, hold on. I, I usually don't forget, but I'm, okay. Um, actually, I'm going to look because for once I've forgotten the first word. I don't do that normally, but you see, you can see how strong it is with me. That's why I'll be perfectly fine once I get it right. Okay. Oh, yeah. On a hill under millions of stars stands a house. Dark, except for one candle, gleaming softly in an upstairs window. When we see the candle, we know that this is our home, that this has always been our home. The next one's called La Dichosa, which means the happy woman. I call you under my breath. When you hear my name, your name, my flown shines in the dark. You are the path of the moon across the water. You are the star by which I sail. Angel, angel, amor. And the last one of these I hope I'm not running over because I forgot to check. <laughs> um, okay, the last one of these, well, there are, there are two. Proye proyección después de la pelea. We have never had an argument. It says projection after the fight. <laughs> well, we haven't. We've never had an argument. So, but, but we, I mean, sooner or later you have arguments, right? Sooner or later. Uh, but I would like to say I don't think it's going to happen. When the wind dies and all is hot and still, we will pick yellow petals and throw them in the water and see how, even so, they float. And this, this is the last one in that series. It says, though we can never be together. That's the title of it. I live with you in the interstice between breath breaths. In the cool, dark hollows the tides leave in the sand. And when the sky turns heel all blue, I fly beside you. And faithfully, every morning we send each other circling hearts and every bedtime kisses. And I wear you under my clothes the way a Sikh wears his cord. In token of the ineffable beauty of the world. Thank you. OK, the last, last section's about death, but it ends happily. <laughs> so one spring day, we're walking on a path of mud and sand beside a, a field of water dotted with lotuses. But not until I turn to comment to you how beautiful all this is do I realize you're not there. Almost to the horizon, a heron is perched on a branch jutting up from the lake. How strange that in all our years of friendship, I never once noticed your wings. Thank you. And the title, of this, this section is called Rehearsing. And it's, uh, this is to my daughter. When you were little, I'd lullaby you every night, stroking your back lighter and lighter until I was feathers, until I didn't exist. OK, I'm going to read this last one because I always like to read one. I almost broke down a red one in the middle, but I almost never do that, so, okay. Someplace I had a 
pair of glasses which have fallen. You see them? No. Huh, no. okay. Well, that's all right. I'll just, I'll squint. Are they just readers? You're welcome. Yeah, they're just readers. You're welcome to these. Thanks. This poem is an important poem to me because I never understood what time was until I wrote it. And it's also a true story. I, I mean, I was shocked, actually. I, so it's called The Discovery. Out walking in my 70s, down a leafy street behind two women in their early 40s who are chatting to each other as companionably as birds on a limb. And having thought with happy anticipation, ah, I'll be their age soon. It occurs to me that I've lost my mind. <laughs> but just then, the clouds evanesce and light pours through the oaks and ash to form lace on the pavement, lovely enough to be sewn into dresses. And I see that time is as random as the patterns the sun makes on any given day as it filters through leaves, and as illusory as a baby being born, and as strange as the years of our lives that go by without returning, and as equal as the one friend's auburn hair and the red leaf she steps over which the wind is abandoned for love of her. And now, having finally seen that the world is every minute new, I realize that I'm only a little younger than those women after all. <laughs> and I step between them, and we speak as we walk. And by the time we part, each of us, in her own way, has told the others how lucky she is to have been alive in such a beautiful place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lola. That was terrific. Um, you got the mic, yeah. yeah. We'll take the mic. Thank you. Wow, to be able to just perform the poems that way is uh, truly extraordinary. Not easy to do at all. Thank you. <laughs> you know, I mean, when you, when you begin and you're little, I ask my friends, you know, can you sing songs? Do you know the words to songs? I say, yes. Well, of course you can say your poems. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I started memorizing songs when I was really little, you know. I remember the first poem I ever wrote. I remember it word for word. It said, Ahem. my life, I read it wrote it when I was seven, and I was illustrating everything with colored pencils. I, yeah. It says, my life is like a candle. It burns a steady flame. But when that candle is burnt out, my life will lose its claim. But then it will be lit once more, and it will burn again. I was in a Catholic school. <laughs> well, thank you. That was that. Yeah, it was a that really, was, really knockout poem. <laughs> that was terrific. We will segue. Uh, we have a few minutes to do um, a Q and A uh, with you guys, and um, and you know, if you have a question, go ahead and raise your hand. Kim, I think has a um, yeah has the microphone, and um, who wants to start us off? Is that this mic? I guess I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, um, yeah. Any questions for the two of them, or or one or the other? Yes. How old is your daughter now? Mine? No, no, yours. Oh, oh mine. Uh, yeah. Oh, thank yeah. you. Oh, yeah. Asking me. <laughs> she's uh, she's eight and a half. Oh, yes. Yeah. It's mm -hmm. yeah. a lovely age. Mm -hmm. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions. I I actually have one, and um, I'm interested. You know, you both talk. You you both write a lot about place in different ways. Um, Lola, your poems always tapping into the natural world the way you do in so many beautiful poems. Um, and then Carolina, with yours, um, you know, with with your mother being Brazilian, your father mm -hmm. from India. I'm wondering if you can both talk about the use of place in your poems. Um, and how you feel they um, end up being part of what you do and how they influence act, the act of writing itself. Can you talk a little bit about the role of place in your writing of poetry? And whoever wants to start, go ahead. She wants to start. Sure. <laughs> sure. Um, I, I mean, actually, um, I, I, about a, a year, or, no, a few years ago, I, I started thinking about how I actually don't write about place. 
mm-hmm. at all because of the fact that I've moved so much. Mm-hmm. And um, and so, I, you know, I I never developed a, a kind of relationship to place that, that you develop, I think, if you live somewhere for a very long time. And so I decided, okay, let me see if I can write about that, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I started to try to... To, to write about place in that way. Um, the poems, the boxes, and self-portrait as a cornfield are both about moving, you know, mm-hmm. and and what is your relationship, you know, when you when you you can't expect a place to hold your memories the way if you have a hometown, I think, you know, it's like every time you go by a certain place, it is associated with something. If you if you don't have that relationship to place, then you kind of have to like just rely on yourself as as the place, as the container of all of it. And so um, I- That's a brilliant statement. Yeah, yeah. well, I-, I Excuse I, my intervening. <laughs> so I, um, I, I started to explore that mm-hmm. idea as kind of like a, a counterpoint to writing about place mm-hmm. as, you know, as the container. Of you know, and I, I guess I mean by that too, mm-hmm. I noticed in some of your poems, when you weave in food, for instance, mm-hmm types of food. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm attaching that to place mm-hmm. because you do, you know, you have a wonderful different vocabulary than what I would know because I'm not from those countries. Um, I'm kind of expanding that to include your use of place. And I love how that kind of fleshes out your poems and, and locates me in this different environment, even though you're not directly hitting on, on place. Um, and I assume yeah. that that's something you're doing on purpose. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Yeah. Lola, how about you? <sighs> Well, I have two places that I write a lot about. Uh, one is the Moors in northern England, because we lived in a house about a mile and a half off a road with no, no power, uh, no services at all, wow. in a very mountainous country when my daughter was little, just toddling. Mm-hmm. And I've been going back ever since, and I walk the Moors all the time. And I think that, and, and then there's Florida, which is really close to my heart. I mean, I kayak, I walk in the woods, I just, I love the landscape of Florida. Um, Let me tell you a quick poem about England because I think that says um, why, how I see place in a way. It's called, um, well, it says, in the stark lands there are no trees to slow the wind. Creatures underground come out only with the stars. There is no other light. The distance to the horizon is a fierce happiness. This is a portrait of my heart. So, I mean, each of those, each of those landscapes is a, as much a portrait of who I am that, you know, completely. I, they're very different from each other, but they're just as real to me. Mm-hmm. And also, I love observing. I mean, I, I just love looking at things. And I always see things because I walk quite a lot. I mean, I walk... Five, five miles a day at least, and sometimes longer, wow. in the woods. And so I'm watching for things, and it's just so joyful to see mm-hmm. things you never noticed. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just really wonderful. Mm-hmm. And it's just a happy way to live for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how's yeah. that? Yeah, no, that's, that's wonderful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I've enjoyed many of your poems about Florida. Thank um, you. In your books, yeah. They're terrific. Can you both talk a little bit about the writing process okay how do you I know that's an old question but there are writers in the audience and talk about craft how do you get going on a poem how do you flesh it out and most especially how do you go about revision of your poems well you can go first (laughs) you want me to go first I don't care I mean it's that's that's question I'm not very comfortable answering. Well, it can change over know. time, but that's okay. okay. Well, that's okay. Because I don't know. I mean, if I'm on a roll, some of my books are very specific. I've got a book which is only about the piano, mm-hmm. playing the piano, mm-hmm. period. And I've got a book called Extranjera, which is only about identity, and it's set in Mexico. So, I mean, those are things where I was on a roll. But in general, it's just, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Do you I usually mean, know what you want to write about when you sit down to write, or no? Um, Is it more of a free yes. write? Well, what? sometimes yes, sometimes no. I mean, if I don't know what I want to write about, I just write as fast as I can without thinking at all, because if I think, I hear my mother. Um, so, 
<laughs> I just, just, just really, really type fast and, and fill about 10 pages. And then I take a highlighter, and if anything looks good, I highlight it. Did you say you type fast? So do you go straight? Do you omit? I always. No, I've always. You know what? When I okay, this is something. Ha! Huh, I can't say something. <laughs> so this has to do with the way I think about it. I write like playing jazz piano. And the other thing is that I write that way because if I hold a pencil or a pen in my hand, I think, oh my God, it's got to say something. And I can't. I freeze. I can't do that. Interesting. Wow. It has to be so it doesn't matter. So you go straight to a type oh, into always. the computer. Okay. Always. Oh, interesting. Yeah. yeah. And then I start. And the other thing is that that lets you start from the beginning without having to cross things off. Um, because I think so often when you start to write something, it's the inspiration that starts you, right? And you're going on and on. And then you realize that the beginning of the things is down here. Mm hmm. And so if you've handwritten that thing, you have to go start all over, but you just erase <laughs> it and you start over. And I uh -huh. like to start over like doing a long jump because maybe I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, I just do it completely from the start again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, How's interesting. That? Yeah, good. That's, that's very interesting. How about you, Carolina? Um, How do you get your poems going? And where do they come question. from, do you think? Well, I, I, um, I tend to write about things that I'm sort of troubled by um, oh, and um, sort of uh, questions that I have. I think that anything that sort of creates a, a dividing line between past and present, like becoming a mother, like, you know, losing my father, any of like where I felt like there was like a stark shift in identity makes me want to write. Um, you know, certain political sense. events, you know, <laughs> pandemic, like anything that makes life feel like there was a before and there was an after, it does like send me to the page. And I think that um, I, I'm writing to try to connect the dots or to understand like why they can't be connected. Mm -hmm. um, and so I tend to be sort of thinking through things when I'm writing. I, I, I don't tend to be a person who's writing out of a uh, delight hmm, okay. <laughs> in, you know, like just enjoying life or, in, you know, enjoying sensations and trying to prolong them by writing. I mean, I, I like read poets who do that. And it's just like a, it, I can appreciate that so much, but it's like a completely foreign thing to me. Interesting. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm trying to figure something out, mm -hmm. and I usually I do like to write longhand. Actually, if I go to if different. I yeah if I go to the computer, um, it it feels too much like um, it's a finished product, mm -hmm. and then I can't. Isn't it interesting yeah. that we're exactly the opposite? Yeah. Yes, I, can, I mean, to me, if it's, it's a finished product, if I had to produce it like this with my hand, mm -hmm. but if I do this, it doesn't matter. Just throw it away. Mm -hmm. So when do you go to the computer? Is it when you're working on revision or? I, I will even try to do the revisions. I'll write the same things like over and over ah, and over okay. mm -hmm. in, Long by hand. hand mm -hmm. And then um, only, only when I think it's, you know, um, like almost, really yeah. almost finished. Uh, interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I really like that. <laughs> Gosh, maybe I can do that. Oh, I couldn't because I can't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Other, George, Stovall, back in the back here. Uh, Kim? We'll just wait, do okay. the mic only That's because fine. people we'll <laughs> who are joining us online can't hear. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yes, I was wondering about your writing schedule and what is your daily routine and um, do you have a, do you have, do you do time blocking? Or, you know, what's the discipline of your writing? Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> Do I have to do that? Well, I, no, I can't. I mean, I, I used to write when I was teaching, and I taught computer science. I didn't teach this because I'd never taught English until I was invited to after I quit teaching computer science. And I taught in an MFA program, but not really. I mean, I'm not. I mean, I'm a coach. I love to coach, but I, I just never went the academic route. I didn't feel that that was right for me. People are different. You know, so I didn't. Um, but I did write on the days I wasn't teaching regularly for years. And now I just write when I have this urge. It gets to me. I know I can feel it coming. And I know 
unless I'm on a roll, in which case I write all the time until I've gotten off the roll, which takes me years sometimes. Mm -hmm. But mostly I, I just write when I have a concept. I mean, I have, oh, a line or not even a line, just an idea. I want to write something. I'll tell you what I'm about. I would like to write. Is there these huge, there's a quarter of a mile strip of um, the biggest cypress trees anybody has ever seen um, off the Wakasasa River where it joins with, the, with, with Lacoochee. And a thousand years ago or so, some uh, tornado came through and tornadoes don't go all the way to the ground and they cut the tops off all those cypress trees. And that's why the Spanish didn't log them because they weren't lo worth logging. And so those trees are still there. They're hollow, but they're not quite dead, and they're still there. And I'd like to write about that. I've got it in my mind. Hmm. At some point, I will. Mm -hmm. yeah. Carolina, how about you? A writing schedule, or no? Um, a, a lot of times I write at night, um, like after, after, your baby's everyone, yeah. <laughs> after everyone's asleep. Yeah. Right. Um, I think, you know, on the days I'm not teaching or during semester breaks, um, then I can get on a roll. Yeah. So, yeah, it has to kind of go around the teaching schedule. Yeah. 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 Okay. George, still, well, you had a question. Something happened to me this afternoon <clears throat> that I realized I would like to come to a poetry reading today, tonight. I mean, I knew it was going to happen, but I didn't think I was going to be coming. I was walking in the woods, and I came upon an old uh, fence, and one of the um, one of the wooden pieces of wood that was at part of the fence. Someone had written this on the piece of wood, and it seemed like it was a young person. The way it was written, it was done with a felt tip pen. But what was written on this fence was, sunsets are proof that endings can be beautiful, too. Wow. <laughs> it wow. just, it, I wrote it in my, my little card. But that kind of poetry or that kind of thought, you know, can just send you a lot of places. That's it was beautiful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Yes, up front here. Thank you. So I was thinking about um, the editing process and wondering if reading aloud ever comes into the editing process, the, the shape of the words, the sound of the words, the performance of the words, because you know we, we read it, but also you perform it, we hear it, so how does that come into your, your writing or editing process? I'd like Good to answer question. that one, if I may. I always say them out loud. I walk and I say them out loud. And I can hear where the problems are if I do that. And if I don't, I can't. It's really important to me. Because to me, poetry is a, a variant on music. And music is a variant on poetry. And if you forget that poetry is actually also music, then you don't do that. But for me, it's always been like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so yeah, I do that always. I remember what I've written, and I go saying it to my, I'm going around saying it to myself. I'm not out, so actually I say it out loud so I can hear it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, when I'm writing, um, I have been told <laughs> that I'm like murmuring to myself. <laughs> and my daughter is actually the one who has pointed it out <laughs> and has said, Mama, are you working on a poem? Because you're mumbling. <laughs> so, so yeah, apparently. I mean, I, I yeah. actually don't like, you know, um, s speak them out, but it is a kind of like, almost like, you know, whispering to myself the poem, like, so, um, yeah, thing. so I can sort of, you know, yeah. feel how it sounds. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so important. It's a great question and um, your your ear will hear things that your eyes won't catch if you're just doing it on the page. That's for sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, Helen, you should answer these questions too. Oh, because, I because, <laughs> you're, because you're, you're, you're a poet. Well, you yeah, should answer them you. too. 
I, thank you. I do. I, you know, I kind of weave in my, my, my thoughts too, but yeah, I think that that's a very important thing. I, I, um, I will read poems aloud as I'm working on them. And then especially as I'm revising them. Um, but yeah, and I don't even know if I, if I even dif differentiate between those two things, cause it's a constant revision process for me. I think it's super important though. Um, yeah, good question. Bob, Devin Jones, yes. a question. Well, it's kind of a question and a comment. Do you have any books, Carolina, on offer outside? I do. Because I ha you said a line in one of your poems, and I'm gonna just hopefully choose the book that the line was in. Mm -hmm. But then another line that you said kind of wiped that one out of my head, and it was the line of, and I'm paraphrasing, but maybe it's right. Uh, you say um, uh, it was a number of years that I knew you till I realized you had wings. Oh yeah, in all our all our years, how strange that in all our years of friendship, I never once noticed your wings. Yes. So when one comes up with a line like that, do you just stop and I don't know, take a rock? victory march around the block, or do you? <laughs> oh, I mean, no. I mean, you know, I, I can only speak for myself. It's mm -hmm. not, I, it's only me. Okay. When I come, okay, so when I come up with that line, that's the end. Well, it was the end for me, too, because, I, I mean, I've had many people in my life, but my partner of 26 years. Oh, gosh. So at some point, I'm going to appropriate that line. I wish you would. You know what? It's, it's yours. <laughs> so you'll see it somewhere. That's good. You can have it. <laughs> That's a wonderful question. I think we probably have time for just one more. Yes, down here in the front. Or... On the wrong side. <laughs> Might I ask what you would recommend reading or what you're reading right now? And it doesn't have to be poetry. <laughs> <laughs> I have kind of a, I have a long, uh, I have a big stack <laughs> that I, uh, I'm just sort of going through. Let me just think here what is in my stack. Um, <laughs> Trace Evidence by Sharif Shanahan. Um, which I think you have read. <laughs> I happen to know Lisa. <laughs> yes, um, and that is one that I has that I've been perusing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll probably think of more. Mm -hmm. Dr. Lola. Huh. Well, I read ancient Chinese poetry a lot, mm -hmm. and I read a lot of novels, mm -hmm. lots and lots of novels. Mm -hmm. There's a really thrilling novel actually called Horse Paradise by Jane Smiley, mm -hmm. and actually, and also. Also, mm -hmm. there's this book called The Hair with Amber Eyes, and that is thrilling. It's, it's nonfiction. Mm -hmm. It's a, a potter in London um, who got inherited all these netsuki, mm -hmm. and he went back to the cities where they came from and he traced his relatives, and it goes from the 18th century on, and it is, I mean, I don't read lots of nonfiction, but this book is just very exciting. You want to read about the salons in Paris when everybody you've ever heard of went to those salons. That's what that's the kind of thing it does. It's just really great. Yeah, I mean I, I can go on and on. I have a list, I have a whole uh, file of my favorite novels. I've got they go all the way back up these pages. And they're annotated. If anybody wants my my file of favorite novels, I'll send it to them. Well, because I love fiction. Mm -hmm. I read more fiction than poetry, actually. Mm -hmm. I like Eulabis's. I think it's called. Like I might. I'm. I'm probably botching up the title, but that I'm reading is. I think it's called Having and Being Had. Um, uh, I love her essay. Who is she? Eulabis. Mm -hmm. huh. Yeah, she's terrific. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Any other questions? Did I miss anyone who had a hand up? Um, OK, well, thank you all so much for coming. Please go out and buy thank books. You. Thank you, Lola and Carolina. <laughs> and thanks for the rest of you at home who are tuning in to the Dolly Poetry Series. It's not easy.